Several months ago, right before the Feast of Tabernacles, Kitty and I were shopping at Lifeway Bookstore. We were looking for a birthday gift for our granddaughter, and Kitty had a coupon from some previous purchases we had made, so we were both looking around the store for a book or for a couple of books. They had out on the uh, table in the front advertising a book that they had on sale, a special, by Philip Yancey. Uh, most of you may have heard of him. I know uh, John Reedy has several times mentioned him and has given some information based upon some of his books. And It was a book that I had not read, and in fact one I'd never even heard of or didn't know he had written. But since I had read a couple of his other books before, one of them was so, What's So Amazing About Grace and Where Is God When It Hurts, I thought I would like to try this book because the other two books were outstanding. And the title itself of the book was somewhat provocative. At the time, I was reading a couple of other books and going through some things, reading John Grisham's latest book and several others. And then later, I, uh, Kitty picked up for me the book Lone Survivor, and I was reading it. So I kept putting it off to start the book, and actually it was about almost three months after we bought it before I started reading the book. And it was one of these situations where when you first get started, you think this is going to be interesting, and then it got to be a situation where it became very introspective, very soul-searching, you might say. Um, this is not intended today to be a book review, but it may seem like it in some senses of the word, because I'm going to be using a lot of material from the book, as well as some of the quotes that he used and some of the works he used within his book by C.S. Lewis. Again, many of you may have heard of the name C.S. Lewis. I've used him many times before. He's the author of one of his most famous books, is Mere Christianity. But for some of you that had children, he is also the one responsible for the Chronicles of Narnia, as well as many, many other books. Both of these men are extremely prolific writers, uh, Christian genre, and are very well known and recognized you know, worldwide. I will also be using the name of the book as the title of this message, and I'll be using a lot of the information directly from the book, some of it quoted, some of it paraphrased. Uh, I'll try sometimes to maybe make a distinction as we go through it but I may not really realize it. But both, as I said, both quoted and, and paraphrased. It's a situation where when you're going through, and I want to make sure, the reason I'm doing all this, that proper credit is given. The title of this book, as I said, and one of the main reasons I picked it up was, was very provocative. Um, and especially to anyone who professes to be a Christian. As we go through the message, I hope that you will keep this title firmly in mind as it is essential to the message itself. And I also suspect, though, however, that each of you will come to some of your own conclusions as to the answer to the question. To answer the question, Yancey is an extremely prolific writer, as I said, but he's also much in demand around the world for speaking engagements, and he travels you know, all the time, not all the time, but a lot of the time. He's sort of a man after my own heart. And after he left off serving on the Christianity Today, he was, he was the editor for Christianity Today. He's now an editor at large for them and does quite a bit of writing for other magazines. But he moved to a mountain cabin in Colorado. And I hated him right away, but uh, he actually, you know, we have some, some commonality there. He is a member of the club that has, has, has actually climbed all of the 14,000 foot mountains in Colorado, something I always wanted to do but never, never was able to accomplish. That's sort of a side, it doesn't have anything to do with the message, but it shows you that the man is just a, a well-rounded individual who I really identify with in many, many ways. As I said, he, he used some of his experiences and his travels around the world in talking with and speaking with other people to, in effect, emphasize, to clarify, and to uh, open up to this question. He went in, in, in a search of, a, of this question that I think if we're honest with ourselves, it's a question that almost every person who has ever lived has had in their life. If you've ever experienced pain, if you've ever experienced a death in your family, if you've ever experienced hunger or thirst or maybe been treated unfairly, it, you've asked this question. So I think that pretty much covers just about everybody in the world at one time or another, some way, somehow. The subtitle to the book is In Search of a Faith that Matters. 
in search of a faith that matters. One of the first things he started off with in the book was quoting a U.S. national poll that was taken in 2000, the end of 2009, 2009 that was published in 2010. In this particular poll, they ask everyone to declare they're religious. Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Baptist, etc., right on down the line. The final, in effect, choice was no religion. In 1957, when this uh, had been previously taken, 2.7% of the people participating in the poll answered no religion. In 2009, it was 16%. had grown over 400%. It exceeded the number of people who checked no religion, exceeded the number of people who, who checked Methodist, Lutheran, Episcopalian, and Presbyterian combined. And in Europe, the numbers were even greater. It was sort of an anomaly in one sense of the word because many of those people, in fact, two-thirds of those people who checked no religion, then checked they believed that God existed. They believed in God. Some, somewhat of an anomaly and a contradiction in one sense of the word. But at the same time, many of those people, if not most of them, described organized religion is hypocritical and or irrelevant. While others simply chose to define it by saying, what good is God? What good is God? A couple of weeks ago, Jeff Reed gave a sermon that he used 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 as his prime reference. I'm just going to quote a portion of it. It says, the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our tribulations. Can we proclaim that we believe that? Can we claim that we understand that, that we can teach other people that? At the same time, can we also believe the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 4, in verse 4, when he says, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is He that is in you. Greater is He that is in you than He that is in this world. Can we proclaim that truth as well as that one concerning the God of all comfort with total and complete confidence? Could we do it to a woman struggling to feed her children without resorting to prostitution? Could we do it to an alcoholic or some other addict who's been battling their entire life with their addiction? To an inmate in South Africa's most violent prison or the man whose teen daughter was raped in a parking garage and they chose to keep the child and they named her Grace? I think the question what good is God, has occurred in some form or at some time to every person who has ever lived. But I also think there's a very deep longing and a deep desire for change within each of us that somehow God will create a permanent state of good from the flawed people, the inhabitants of this planet. Do we have such a hope? Do we have such a faith? And if not, what good is God? In his book, Yancey visits, or goes back to and calls upon his experience, of ten different stories from such diverse places as Virginia Tech. If you remember back in 2007, the spring of 2007, 32 people were massacred on the campus when a Korean student went through a mass killing which turned out to be the worst mass shooting in U.S. history and still stands that way today. 32 people he killed and then he killed himself. He called upon a story he brought from the underground church in China. A story he learned in South Africa both before and after apartheid. 
and then one concerning the Christian church in one of the most diverse and contradictory places you could go to in the Middle East. Where on the one hand, you've got the Bedouins in the sand dunes, and then in some of these more prosperous nations where they have the oil flowing, some of the biggest skyscrapers and biggest you know, resort areas in the world, the people from all over the world are going to, and the underground church that is there. But probably the most contradictory one he went to was he went to a women's ministry conference in Green Lake, Wisconsin. And they were ministering to, at that particular conference, both former and current professional sex workers. And then there were several other places in between that he went to. We won't go through all of those because we simply don't have the time to do that today. If you want to hear about them all, you'll have to read the book, which I recommend you do if you would like to do that. At Virginia Tech, Yancey took with him a young lady. Her name was, uh, was Casey, and I'm going to probably uh, just tear up her last name, but I think it's Rugsager. Some of you may have read the story. You might have even heard her name. Casey Rugsager, who, though critically wounded and permanently disabled, she lived. Of the 36 people who were shot and 13 who died, she was one of six in the library where the um, killer first came in and she pretended after he had shot her to be dead and she lived. The reason he took her with him was because she and her dad had continued to go on after that to talk to other people who went through similar kinds of situations and he knew and she knew that she knew exactly what these people were going through who were survivors of this shooting. Because you remember that shooting she went through was at Columbine High School in Colorado in 1999. In similar situations like this, and you've seen it on television before, people will build, whether you call it memorials or whatever you want to call it, where they'll leave flowers, they'll leave uh, stuffed animals, uh, some will you know, compare poems or leave messages or whatever. There were a couple of messages that people left for the shooter at Virginia Tech. One said, I wish I could have shown you his love, speaking of God, his love, his passion, and his truth, for it has set me free. Another one said, I hope in your next life you do not have to resort to violence to be heard. Casey, in talking with the survivors, told them that even after eight years, I still am scared and startled when I see one coming toward me in an overcoat. Because if you remember, the young man had the gun hidden under the overcoat. And she, that visual image comes into her mind. And after eight years, this was in 2007, she was still scared. She knew what these people were going through. Philip Yancey himself almost didn't take the engagement, the speaking engagement, because of the fact that earlier that year he hit a slippery place in Colorado on a mountain road, slipped off the road, turned over several times, and he actually had broken his neck. And for three months, I think it was, or maybe it was a little bit longer than that, he wore a neck brace, and for a long period of time he wasn't able to do anything hardly other than just you know, lay there for many years for many months. So he was wearing a neck brace as a result of that car crash that had almost killed him. He said that somehow or another, the brace and wearing the brace gave him a, uh, an identity, gave him a feeling of more at ease with the students because as he said, all pain is pain. These people were hurting for a different reason, but he was still hurting as a result of his neck and he said somehow or another it just helped him uh, to begin to identify a little bit with everyone. The pain comes whether it's a destructive teenager who's ruining their life and the family they belong to, whether it's the recurrence of cancer that comes up after you thought you had licked it, whether it's a random shooting as we saw at Virginia Tech, at Columbine, at Sandy Hook Elementary. We could keep on naming them. I actually went through and Googled up all of the, the mass shootings we've had in, in the United States and it's, it's, it's a very unsettling reminder of the times that we live in. 
And of course, what happened in France this past weekend. They are all painful. They all cause problems and they all would help us in effect to sum up the question, what can faith offer at such a time as this? And what good is God? But you know, when we really think about it, if we look at the scriptures even, even God is not exempt from pain. In John 3, 16, one of the most famous scriptures there is, it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Don't think that wasn't pain? Look at the nation of Israel who had the chance to have everything, the leaders He put into place, like Saul, Solomon, and even David to a certain extent. To, to, to obey God, to do what He's supposed to go, do, and they would have had everything. But you know the story. I've been recently going through Joshua and Judges and Kings and Chronicles and Samuel and it just reiterates again. You know, you sit there and we reread it and I'm not saying I'd have done any better when I was there. Why in the world didn't the nation of Israel listen to God? Because everything would have been there. What did Solomon ask for when God asked him to ask for anything he wanted? Wisdom. But as a result of that, he gave him fame and fortune. But he, you know, he in effect flushed it all down the drain. So God experienced pain, I'm sure, at that particular time. Another scripture, Mark 15, verse 34, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When Jesus Christ himself spoke those words as he was on the stake, I'm sure God was in pain. His father was in pain. Because to love means to hurt. Because if anybody we love hurts, we hurt with them. Pain is actually a sensation of life. It's a part of life. And God will always, if we believe Him, if we listen to what He tells us, will be with those who suffer. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now listen to this. Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword? How many of us have actually gone through all of those? Or maybe one of them or two of them. Very few of us. As it is written, for your sake we are all killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. God who loved us. For God loved us so much that He gave His only begotten Son. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature. In effect, nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yancey in his book, the one he wrote I mentioned before earlier, Where is God When It Hurts? He has a section there where he explains, because he talks about pain in that book a lot, how lepers don't feel pain because of the type of disorder they have. He has seen a leper actually stick their hand down into a roaring fire to pull out something out of it because they don't feel pain. Or they'll grab a hot pot on the stove and burn themselves and actually disfigure themselves sometimes, but they just don't feel pain. Pain is something God created because He loves us. It helps us. It takes care of us. It is actually a blessing. Now I know sometimes when we're in pain, we don't look at it that way, but sometimes the alternative is a whole lot worse. So pain is a blessing, and coincidentally as well as that, grief that we go through sometimes proves love. Because we grieve for someone when they are hurting as well. When someone we love, something has happened. Yancey closed his remarks to the students at Virginia Tech by urging them 
is they left campus because it happened at a sort of a bad time. It was at semester break or at the end of the school year, which it was now. And they were a little bit afraid because they had a support group there for all those people who were survivors, but they were leaving that. And this was one of the things that Casey's, uh, uh, kind of last name now, uh, Rooksucker, uh, was scared about too because she said what, at Columbine they had the support group of family and others right there with them. But she was afraid that they would not have that. Yancey told them in Romans 12, in verse 9, Let your love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, and cleave to that which is good. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. That in verse 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. In verse 17. Recompense to no man, evil for evil. What is our automatic reaction when something like that comes out? When something happens to us? We want to pay that person back what they have done to us. Verse 21. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That's hard to do. It's hard to do for anyone. He finally closed his meeting with the students with 2 Corinthians chapter 1, which I had just previously mentioned that Jeff had in his sermon. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation. Now here is a part of that that sometimes we forget. That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. But it was mentioning Ron concerning his hand injury that actually happened last Friday. We had mentioned to him last Sabbath uh, that he had a reoccurrence of this cancer that's been bothering him for some years. So it, it happened actually last Friday. But one of the things I remember some stories he used to tell of how a couple of times he went through some very difficult situations in his life. And in a very short period of time after that, he had to counsel with some people who were going through, going through for all practical purposes, the exact same thing. He was prepared. He didn't like what he was going through at the time he was going through it. But it says here that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and your salvation. So where is God when it hurts? He's where His people are. He is where those that are in misery are. He's where faith is. He is where a faith that matters is. So that is what good God is. One of the other stories that he mentions in his uh, book, and as I said, probably the most unusual one, was his invitation to speak at a women's conference that ministered to women who were involved in prostitution. His wife wanted to know a whole lot more about the uh, conference before she said, yeah, you can go. So <laughs> they asked a few questions before he went. Uh, but he said he was so thankful, and his wife was too, because she went with him, that they went. It was a, it was a conference focusing, focused on ministering to these women with 45 different organizations represented from 30 different countries and over 100 different women who were actively involved in at the time or were previously active in prostitution. His opening statement to the ladies when he had a chance toward the end of the conference to speak to them alone, he said, I never thought I would be sitting next to a bunch of prostitutes comparing their daily quotas. You know, you got to think about that for a minute. He did a little something a little bit light to try to, you know, how many of us think we'll ever be in that kind of a situation or, or find ourselves in that circumstance? He was the only man, he said, in a room full of women 
who all were or had been professional sex workers. The last question that Yancey asked of the women that were there, it concerned in Matthew chapter 21 in verse, uh, in, in verse 31. And if you go back prior to that, Christ is actually speaking to the chief priests and the elders. He says, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. He asked the women, what do you think Jesus meant by that? Why did he single out these women, these harlots? There was an extremely long period of silence. And finally, a young woman from Eastern Europe spoke up and said in her broken English, everyone has someone they look down upon, but not us. We are the lowest. Our families are ashamed of us. And no mother, this is her language, no mother nowhere looks at her little girl and says, Honey, when you grow up, I want you to be a good prostitute. She said, We're the lowest. We're at the bottom. Everybody else has somebody to look down upon, but we're at the bottom. And when you are at the low, you cry for help. So when Jesus comes, we respond. You know, it made a lot of sense. Yancey, in responding to the answer, as it were, to the question, and a part of this is the reason I mentioned the fact he lived in Colorado, he says, grace is like water. It flows downward. It relentlessly seeks the lowest point. So no matter how low we sink, Grace flows to that point. He had seen many years in hiking the hills of Colorado, the mountains, how the water will come down off the mountain and actually create, you know, streams and, and cut out canyons. That's how the Grand Canyon was formed. It's a powerful force. And he made the analogy between that and the power of grace and how the grace will come to wherever it needs to be. You know, from the very earliest of times, too many who profess to be Christians have denied the simple fact that is stated so plainly in Scripture in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Paul continually fought against the Pharisaical and the self-righteous who scorned certain categories of sinners. They would talk about how these people were worse than other people. But you know, the Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men would count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, we talk about biblical heroes. And of course, the very first one of that is Jesus Christ. But if you go through the first chapter of Matthew and look at the lineage of Jesus Christ, there are harlots. There are adulterers. There are killers. Murderers, if you want to call it that. Repentance is available. So no matter who we are, no matter what we have done, the door of repentance is open. But we have to walk through. We are all, every one of us, products of God's grace. Now, now maybe some a little bit more obvious than others. But Christ came for the sinners. He came to redeem us all. Not just those sitting in church. When our church is not for sinners. When we start categorizing and ranking sins, that's when I stop attending. Christ and the Apostle Paul both strongly condemn such practices and remind us that he who is without stone, without sin, cast the first stone. I think I would feel very confident if I had given before this message started every person in here a stone and now I walked out and laid down on the carpet and said, He who is out sin cast the first stone. I think I would probably be able to get up without a stone being cast. 
Yancey, like so many other people who have read him, if not most everybody who's read him, is a big fan of C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis, a lot of people don't know, was an atheist to begin with. It was later said by one of his cohorts, the most converted man I've ever met. Now maybe some of us might not consider that because he doesn't observe the Sabbath. I have a question with that too. Philip Yancey was a big fan of C.S. Lewis. He quotes him regularly and often, as do many other writers and speakers who have read him. He said of Lewis, He has been my constant companion, a shadow mentor who sits before me, urging me to improve my writing, my thinking, my vision, and especially my life. He says, Yancey said, Lewis did not impose faith like a preacher might via a line of reasoning, and I hope I'm not doing that today, but he drew it out as a natural byproduct of life. Very much like Lewis, Yancey also engaged in a tug of war, as in his own words, a tug of war with God, fighting against, against his concept of God as a what he called a cosmic bully. Yancey went to a Bible college in the South, and after hearing the stories he told, a lot of you uh, have heard some of the stories told of some of the things that went on in Bastard College and some of the years of how strict certain things were. That was the most liberal college on the face of the earth compared to the one he went to. I mean, it was unreal. And um, Yancey very much delighted in pricking folks and challenging concepts and in bringing up contra opinions. And he said he was surprised he was never kicked out. But uh, he made it all the way through and went on a little bit further. But as, as Lewis was, a, as he said, an atheist, he fought against this concept he had of God being a cosmic bully, only to finally come to the conclusion and find a God of grace and a God of mercy. He said, a faith that matters must completely permeate all of our life. Not just when we're writing, in his case, not just when we're speaking. But you know, we have that old saying, do we walk the walk or do we talk the talk? We can talk Christianity till we're blue in the face. But how well do we do when we're actually walking, especially when we're not in church and we're walking in circumstances that maybe are not as conducive to Christian behavior as they should be? Because if we don't walk the walk, and just talk the talk. Do we really have a faith that matters? And if we don't, then what good is God? What good is God if we don't have a faith that matters? C.S. Lewis once wrote that he most desired death during the joyful moments of his life, not when life was hard or difficult, as he said, the pleasures of life always pointed to another world. Because he, he said, all good things, and even the Bible says this, serves as proofs of a good God. Because all good and perfect gifts come from above. He mentioned the scripture, or didn't mention the scripture, but mentioned the quotation from the scripture, when it says, all joy. And he compared that as distinctive from what he called mere pleasure. The scripture is found, one of the scriptures is found over in James chapter 1, and verse 2, where it says, Brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now, I don't know about you, but at the time it happens, I have difficulty doing that. I just don't say, hey, this is the most joyous things I've ever had in the world. No, you go through it and you try to get through it some way or another. Romans chapter 15, verse 13, Now the God of hope Fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's the reason Lewis said that this world, all the good, pointed to another world. And it proved that God was good. It also points to our emphasis and our status as pilgrims. As people who are passing or sojourning through this world that we live in today. Hopefully it wakes up the desires within us. 
but it always reminds us and beckons to us that this life is just a rehearsal for the next. To Lewis, life's pleasures were what he called the drippings of grace. I like that sound, the drippings of grace. And life, the, the pleasures of life, the delights of life, they were good. But he said they just aren't good enough. In Romans 8, in verse 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. To C.S. Lewis, to answer the question, what good is God? He was a unifier. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We can't even unify in our church congregations. And that's not just true in this congregation. It's true in every Baptist church, every Presbyterian church, Episcopalian, you know, every other denomination you reach. We, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man in the measures of the stature of the fullness of Christ. To Lewis, all the works of mankind should offer consolation to this, as he described it, wounded planet, while also awakening with each of us a deep desire for the ultimate healing that is coming. For what we do on earth today plays a meaningful role and what he described as the great dance that will one day heal this universe. When a single sinner repents, what happens in heaven? The angels rejoice, the scriptures tell us. Every moment of life has meaning. In acknowledging us created in the image of God, in every person, underlining and emphasizing every person, Lewis said there are, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal, but it is simply people who are created to be immortals. That's us. Yeah, we're mortal right now. We bleed. We hurt. We have pain. But we were created to be immortals. Remember that because those are the people that we joke with, that we work with, that we love. But unfortunately, sometimes the people also that we snub or ignore or even hate. We who now see through a glass darkly, in the end, we'll see face to face. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I only know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known immortal, created in the image of God. So how do we, how do we as ordinary mortal, I just contradicted myself, <laughs> men and women who have a role to play, how do we answer the question, what good is God? Do we have a faith that matters? Do we answer it every day by our service of excellence and in humility? Do we answer it at home, at work, at play, in all of life? For the one who professes to be a Christian and who tries to live by a strict legalism of the law becomes a danger because it quenches the spiritual life rather than enhancing it. Legalism can be and has been a way for some to try to convey superiority. We never want to lose sight of the freedom that we have in Christ and the love that is based upon grace and forgiveness and not some legalistic approach to the Word of God. Yancey quoted in his book, D.L. Moody, who's the founder of the Moody Institute, the Moody Bible College, and some, several other organizations. He was asked if he was filled with the Spirit. He said, yes, but I leak. <laughs> and I, I thought that was one of the best things in the book in one sense of the word. I said, yeah, I identify. 
Do we sometimes leak the Holy Spirit? Do we love our Christian lifestyle or do we love God? Because you know, God, Scripture says, is love. Do we not only believe in God, but know to the depth of our being that God believes in us? The faith of a Christian can sour if we attempt to isolate ourselves from others or from the rest of the world. If we narrow our vision and in effect achieve a type of artificial piety. That happened at Ambassador College. We were isolated to some extent from the real world. And but as I said, to hear Yancey tell his story, uh, we were right out in the middle of the world because that place was unreal. So what good is God? What good is God? He has rescued us all. He has saved our lives. He gives us a future after this mortal life. And for whatever reason, God chose to make Himself known primarily through ordinary people just like you and just like me. We are the ones called to demonstrate a faith that matters to a world that's waiting, a world that's watching. And then He gives us the freedom to make that choice, to be a part of His family, to be a part of His ultimate plan of salvation, to save mankind in order to be a part of His family. What good is God to you?